Alleluia. Glory to Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we are in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 22, and we will be discussing peer pressure. So we read 1 Kings, chapter 22, verse 1. And they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. Now, to put you in context, this is a time when Ahab is king in Samaria in the kingdom of Israel. And at the same time, Jehoshaphat is king in the kingdom of Judah in the south. And they're going to form a league to go and fight against the Syrians to take back possession of a piece of land, Ramoth Gilead. Verse 3, And the king of Israel, that is Ahab, said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth in Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, that is Ahab, I am as thou art. My people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And so we have a nice spiritual image here reminding us that within the body, inside of the body, the different gifts that we have, the different tools that we have, and the different resources that we have, we should put them in common for the benefit of the body. And so the leg and the arm can collaborate and come together so that they can bring the assets, each their own assets, and put them in common and say, whatever I have, me, the leg, you, the arm, you can use, and vice versa. And Jehoshaphat has that mind to say, what is mine is thine. Let us come together and work for the benefit of our nation together. Verse 4, And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. No division. Verse 5, And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about four hundred men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And so here you see Jehoshaphat being prudent, inquire at the will of the Lord concerning what it is that the Lord wants us to do, because we want to do his will. You will remember in the book of Judges, Jephthah had told the Lord to give him victory, and that in exchange, he would give the first person or the first thing coming out of his house in sacrifice to the Lord. And it turned out to be his virgin daughter who came out of his home when he returned to his house victorious. And so Jephthah had tried to give God direction and told God, you give me victory and I will give you this in return. Whereas here, Jehoshaphat is doing things properly. Ask the Lord what he wants and how he plans to orchestrate it. And then you can go forward with that plan. In the same manner that Gideon, still in the book of Judges, in chapter 6, Gideon will be told by God, I'm going to raise you as one man to defeat the Midianites. But Gideon will ask several confirmations to the Lord to make sure that he's operating within the boundaries of the plan of the Lord as designed by the Lord himself. And so this is just a side note to say that when we want to act, we want to make sure we're acting in accordance with the will of the Lord. And so Jehoshaphat, in that time, in the Old Covenant, they spoke to God through the prophets. And so he wants to go through the prophets to get the answer from God to confirm that it is his will that Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, 
would join and make a league with Ahab, king of Israel. And so verse 5, And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides, that we might inquire of him? And so this will remind you of how when Samuel was looking for David, David was not present with the rest of his brothers. And yet they asked, is there yet another brother? And they said, yes, there is David, and they went to fetch him. It's the same dynamics here. And so there is often that odd person. There's often that black sheep that seems to be somewhere else, but that is of importance, and we should not minimize or neglect people who seem to be different than the rest, because often God will work with power through that one person who seems to be an outcast. And so Jehoshaphat there being prudent wants to make sure that he's heard from all the prophets. Verse seven, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. Why? Because you want to hear truth. Even if it hurts you, you want to hear truth from people and not flattering words. And in these end times, people indeed are seeking teachers that are preaching pleasant things to their ears, but not preaching to them the truth, because they cannot stand sound doctrine. And so the flattering words of a friend are not better than harsh words spoken from someone who truly cares about you. And this is also showing us something else. There are people who are more interested in hearing what they want to hear than to hear the truth of God. And so here King Ahab is indicating to us that he's more interested in hearing things that please him rather than things spoken by the prophet coming out from the mouth of God, though these things would be difficult to hear. And this is very dangerous that you would not want truth over something that is pleasant to your ears for the sake of satisfying your own carnal lusts in terms of what you want to hear. And in doing that, some people overlook the importance and the privilege that they have of actually having access to truth. But Jehoshaphat is prudent still and says it is better to know the whole truth rather than to try to find something pleasant to the ear. Verse nine, then the king of Israel called an officer and said, hasten hither Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. And Zedekiah, the son of Kenana, made him horns of iron. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, With these shalt thou push the Syrians until thou have consumed them. You have some people who will come up with methods that catch the eye to get your attention. But the props are not necessarily a reflection of the truth. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. And so all the prophets here expressed a common opinion. All the prophets spoke with one voice. Verse 13, And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, 
the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them and speak that which is good. And so there is intimidation. There is peer pressure. There is pressure to conform to the norm. Because there is a majority, because there is apparent strength in numbers, we find out that a lot of people will find comfort in expressing an opinion that is popular. But the Bible teaches us that though you have 10 strong men, one wise man is greater than them. And also you will remember how Balak tried to pressure Balaam into saying something, into cursing the people of the Lord, and he was going to provide him with a reward of divination to pronounce a curse. Now let's look at what Micaiah is going to do, verse 14. And Micaiah said, as the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Micaiah takes a stand and says, I will speak what the Lord tells me. I will not add or take away from the word of the Lord. I will speak that which the Lord has spoken to me. And therefore, I will do the will of the Lord in the context of my ministry and will not look to my left or to my right to know if I should rather try to be in conformity with the majority, assuming that there is strength in numbers. Having enough spiritual violence in me to stand on my own if I must in order to speak truth. And this is very powerful. And so there can come people to you and they will be prophets like you are. And this is the image of saints in the body who may have similar gifts as you have. And they will tell you being in great number that they have a certain perspective about something or that they have a certain understanding of doctrine, and they will try to sway you or even impose unto you that you would have the same view, the same perspective that they share concerning a certain issue. And it becomes difficult in your flesh to actually stand on the word of the Lord and say otherwise. So you can deal with people like that in the body. A prophet dealing with other prophets. It can come by way of someone who is an external actor, but who brings money to you. The example of Balak and Balaam. Someone can come with money and try to have you say something different than what the Lord has told you to say. And also, the reason why you may choose to fold when you are pressured this way, because you fear being rejected. You fear becoming an outcast. You fear being thrown out of a group of believers, of a local church that you have integrated, and you fear being thrown out because you already suffered the pain of separation that occurs upon conversion. You're separated from the world, but this is just a first separation. As you are being perfected, you're going to suffer many more separations even inside the faith. And this is where it's difficult. Because the separation from the world is so difficult, it hurts so much, but God gives you the strength to go through it, that you are hesitant to suffer more separations once you're in the faith and you have a sentiment that you have found people just like you who came to the faith, and now you're scared to have disagreements inside the faith. And fearing further separations, you are trying to compromise and find a niche And you start compromising about what you know to be the truth and what the collectivity considers to be the truth. And so in clearer words, sometimes you may be part of a local assembly, a local congregation, a local church, where they have a set of predetermined positions concerning doctrine. And while you know that concerning one or two points, you have a different opinion, you're not willing to let that stand out because you fear that they will put you away and you are scared of yet experiencing more separations the way you did when you came out of the world into the faith. And so we are bold in the beginning. 
We are bold. We believe that we've been separated from the world and this is it. We're going to run the race and make it to the finish line easy, but it's not so. Micaiah had a strong conviction, but look what happened. Verse 15, so he came to the king and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall we forbear? And he answered him, go and prosper for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Now, if you look back at verse 12, look at what all the prophets had prophesied with one mouth. Verse 12, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. Look at the words of Micaiah in verse 15, right after he said, I will speak what the Lord has told me, that will I speak. But what does he speak in verse 15? Exactly the same words that the prophets spoke in unison. Verse 15, go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Micaiah heard the Lord tell him a first thing, and we're going to find out what vision he had prior. He had received direct information from the Lord, but he also heard from men. And yet, though the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. And Micaiah's flesh is going to get the best of him so that he will tell the king what the other prophets have expressed. Why? Fear of rejection, fear of men, fear of being displeasing to the king, fear of being set aside, fear of being a castaway. And so Micaiah is going to echo what other people are saying when he knows in his heart that it's not the truth. He knows in his heart that he has had a personal encounter with God and received direct information from God that is truth, but yet he compromises for the sake of carnal considerations. What will people say about me? Am I going to suffer retaliation, consequences for having a different opinion? Will I end up alone by the wayside? where I would want to fit in with the other prophets, where I would want to fit in the body, where I would want to be accepted by people in positions of authority in the image of the king. Do I compromise about the truth that I have received? See, some people have had experiences where they met the Lord, sometimes face to face. They've been taken up to the heavens and they have received things they have received secrets. They've had the grace of experiencing extraordinary things. The way that Paul would say, I met a man who was taken up to the third heaven. And so there are men who have had great experiences. But yet, when they return amongst men, after great spiritual experiences, the pressure to conform can lead them to even start to forget what they experienced with the Lord one-on-one -on -one and the information that they received one-on-one -on -one, to start now being in conformity with the local church, with other saints in the local church or the leaders of that church. So now, which is it? Are you going to have God tell the truth and man be a liar or the other way around? And so the spirit of Micaiah had good intentions. I will speak what the Lord saith unto me. Verse 14. But in verse 15, the flesh takes over and he repeats exactly what the other prophets have said with one voice, having been the object of intimidation prior. Speak that which the prophets have spoken with one mouth now. Let thy words be like the words of the prophets. Speak that which is good. That was verse 13. Verse 16. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? And here, I think we have a nice image where the Lord gives you a chance to make things right. The Lord can use someone to remind you that there's something that you have heard that you were given in private that you were given directly from the Lord and had the privilege of receiving a certain piece of information and you're holding back 
and the Lord uses another person to get it out of you. The Lord gives you a chance, if you have faltered, to stay rooted in him and stand strong on the word of God and deliver truth. And where Micaiah had withheld truth, God orchestrated that he would give him another chance at speaking that truth. And so Ahab will prompt Micaiah to speak the truth. Verse 17. And now we're going to find out that Micaiah indeed had received privileged information from the Lord, a, a tremendous vision, and yet he was willing to bury that so that he could be in conformity with the body of saints, with the body of prophets, so that he could be in good standing with a person of authority, the king, so that he would not fear being cast away from the local church. In the same manner that the people were scared to speak in John chapter 9 concerning the man born blind, even his parents, they feared being thrown out of the local church, of the synagogue. In 3 John, Diotrephes had preeminence and wanted to have preeminence over all, and so he even sanctioned others who would assist missionaries coming from abroad to their local church by saying, if you help them come here, in the local church that I am heading, me, Diotrephes, I can cast you out of the synagogue, of the congregation, of the local church. Intimidation. And so the fear of men can get you to not speak truth because you fear retaliation, the consequences, and you also have a desire to fit in, and therefore you don't want to ruffle any feathers. Now we find out that Micaiah had received tremendous revelation from the Lord. Let us find out what he saw. Verse 17, and this is Micaiah speaking, and he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? And so you see here again, another level of intimidation. There are comments that are made that are derogatory, even along the lines of mockery, to discredit you. But you must be steadfast concerning the truth that you have received. Fear not men, but fear he who can kill both the body and the soul. Verse 19, and he said, that is Micaiah, hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord, and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth, and do so. And so Micaiah revealed that he had received privileged information from the Lord, and that he had knowledge of the truth, as received directly from the Lord. And so sometimes you have experienced something. You have had an intimate experience with the Lord where he has revealed truth to you. But if you are not careful, your flesh can bring you to a desire of conformity, a desire to be pleasant to the fellow saint, a desire to be pleasant to the local church, a desire to be pleasant to all parties around you so that you are not set aside or cast away for having a different opinion, for speaking a word which is not in line with the one voice that is spoken by the local church, by other saints, or by the church leaders. And so therefore, this raises the question for all of us, who is stopping you from doing the ministry? or who is trying to put pressure on you to do the ministry according to their own will, rather than according to what the Lord has told you to do. And so there are different ways that you will 
experience that type of pressure. You see, Jesus has a child. His parents asked him, how is it that you stayed behind in Luke chapter 2? And he explained that he wanted to do the will of the Father, and that was his priority over following his parents. And so your family can be the people also who interfere and try to intrude on your relationship that you have with the Lord. Another example is when Jesus was speaking to the people and his relatives came and said, we need to have a word with you. But he said, my true family are those who do the will of the Father, the people who are part of the body. And so he told his family, in other words, to wait a second until he was done doing what he was doing in terms of his ministry and speaking to the people about the Lord and finish doing the work of the Father before he would be concerned about what his family desired. And so this is a moment in time where you have to confess publicly that you serve the Lord even over the affairs of your family. And this is powerful because a lot of people serve the Lord in secret concerning their family. Their family does not know. And sometimes the Lord will orchestrate circumstances where you will be confronted publicly in terms of having to tell your family who is seeing you now in action and you have to keep going and doing what it is that you're doing for the Lord in front of them and even declare to those in the faith that you are taking care of the things of the kingdom even before you are taking care of the things of your relatives where the Lord wants you to focus on the kingdom at that time. And so this is another source of pressure, your family members. We have seen that it could be someone with money, an external actor, the likes of Balak, who wants to control the message that you preach when you yourself have received the message from the Lord to preach. It can be also people from within the faith who want you to speak in accord with what they're saying where you would have doctrinal differences and where you know that you've heard from the Lord and that what you've heard is not anti-scriptural. An example of someone who is in the faith and who may also throw you off balance is in 1 Samuel chapter 1. You have Hannah who is praying because she desires to have a child, a man-child, and you have Eli, a priest, someone who is supposed to be in the faith, telling her, are you drunk? What are you doing? When Hannah is praying wholeheartedly to the Lord, where Eli should encourage this, he makes her feel as though she is in error. And so sometimes the pressure comes from the inside also. And so I am saying, who is deterring you from doing the will of the Father? Your wife, your children, your friends, some outside influences who have money and who are trying to control what you are doing because they are financing you, because you're not letting the Lord finance himself the projects that he has given you. God always provides if he's called you to do something so that you don't depend on another man. He can touch certain people to give you funds, but you will know that it's coming from the Lord. But where it is an external actor, such as a Balak, then they want to control what you're doing you should know then that there's an issue, there's a problem there. So who's controlling you? Who is hindering you? Is it another saint? Are you compromising and continuing to walk with that person? Are you telling God that you would prefer friendship with that person rather than the truth of God, even though it means you have to be alone with God to continue in truth? You see, the principle according to which narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life, it applies once you're in the faith. Broad is the way for those in the faith who want to come into conformity where they know that there are serious differences of opinions and disagreements concerning the pillars of the faith. And so broad is the way that you can blend in the crowd and be on the same page as the one voice that this body of saints has or that this local church has but where you know there is error because the lord spoke to you you have to be violent and be willing to separate 
And so whether it be someone with money, whether it be someone in the body, or whether it be the fear that we have that we will be rejected, we have to stick to the truth, especially where, like Micaiah, we have received a privileged piece of information. We have received truth even by the Lord himself. And therefore, the spirit must be willing. And though the flesh is weak, we have to let the Lord be our rock so that we can stand on his word, no matter what the circumstances. And therefore, brothers and sisters, this is what I wanted to bring to your attention today. Look at your life and try to see with the relationships that you have, who is hindering you, if it be the case, to do the will of the Lord, because they're coming at you with actions that are equivalent to telling you what you should be doing and not encourage you to rather do what you have heard from the Lord insofar as it is not contrary to scripture, what you have received and consider it to be the truth. Are they pushing you and encouraging you to go and do that and walk in your ministry or do what you were called to do? Or are they trying rather to rally you to their cause where they feel that you should walk according to their truth where you know that their truth is error. Now, let's read verse 23 so we can bring up a last point. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. And so Micaiah is explaining that the prophets of Ahab have spoken ill because the Lord had put a lying spirit in them. Watch the reaction from Zedekiah, verse 24. But Zedekiah, the son of Kenana, went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? In other words, what happened to that spirit of lying in me? When did it get into you now, who is speaking nonsense? Verse 25. And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see in that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. And so what I wanted to highlight here in verse 24 is that sometimes even the person who is trying to rally you to be in alignment with their position, they can be wrong, but not know it. They can even have the utmost confidence that they are in the truth and that you are in error. But this is where you must now be solid in terms of remembering what the Lord told you and standing strong on these words. Micaiah had a vision. He saw what happened before the throne of the Lord. And therefore, nobody can take that away from him. It's up to him to hold fast to that vision and to the truth that he has received even from God himself and not be deterred even by someone who seems to be convinced 100% that they have the truth when you know for a fact that they're wrong. And so this adds to the level of difficulty in terms of separating yourself from certain people because they are seemingly convinced that they have the truth, but you know that they are in error. And so this was the last point I wanted to, to bring to your attention. And so we have received precious things from the Lord, and we have to be careful. Even inside the faith, there is peer pressure. You must believe the doctrine that the local church is upholding, but maybe you have seen error in it. Are you favoring the local church or are you favoring God? Even if it means that you will be alone with God, a single voice that is cast away, but you're still in tune with God, which is more important for you. Shall man be a liar and God be truthful or will you have it the other way around? Is it that because of financial considerations, you're compromising about truth because there is an external actor who is putting pressure on you? Is it that your desire to be part of a group and to conform to other saints in the body, is that bringing you to a place where you're setting aside a truth that you have received so that you can walk with the people in greater numbers and not be that voice, that lone voice in the corner, cast away? the way that Micaiah was, and they had to go and get him, the way that David was the odd man out, and they had to go and get him? Or do you feel like you are 
not affirming the position that you have because you feel like the other people who have a different opinion are so sure of themselves, though they be in error. So there you have it, brothers and sisters, peer pressure. And it can come from your family, from people in the faith, and it can come from yourself because you're scared to be a castaway. But you have to stand strong on the word of God and the truth that you even have received from the Lord himself on top of the word of God that you have where God may have spoken to you clearly concerning certain things. May you be blessed, brothers and sisters, in the mighty name of Yehoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Alleluia. Amen.